How's everybody doing? <laughs> it's been uh, great to be here with you guys, and I really want to share with you this morning some thoughts that I've kind of been putting together for a while, and then kind of wrapping them together with some of the things that the other presenters have said throughout this conference to give you some tools going home when we say Veni Sancte Spiritus. Um, this talk is called Movement Forward, how we can take the promptings of the Spirit and, and move them uh, in, our, in our ministries back at our parishes. Now, this logo that was developed for this year, uh, when we first came up with this, uh, Carlos, one of our designers who's just really talented, he does a lot of the banners and that, with this dove, with the Holy Spirit coming out of it, um, when Father Bob Schreiner, one of our board members who spoke last year at, the, like, at this training convention, when he saw this logo, he said, the theology of that is brilliant. And we're like, really? And he's like, yeah, did you, did you think about what you implied there? And we said, well, no, tell us more, Father Bob. We, we'd like to be uh, on the same page. We're probably already thinking it, but go ahead and say it. And he said, well... See, most people, when they say veni sancte spiritus, it's like, come Holy Spirit, descend Holy Spirit to us. He said, but when we talk about the new Pentecost, really, the new Pentecost isn't that the first Pentecost didn't take. Because I always thought about that. People say, the new Pentecost. And you're like, well, wasn't the first one good enough? Like, did the Lord just not give a, a large enough dose of the Holy Spirit and we need it again? He says, no, what it is is that the Holy Spirit came down and through those sacraments of baptism and confirmation, we receive the Holy Spirit and we have the Holy Spirit within us. But what we need to do for the new Pentecost is to unleash the Holy Spirit in our life, to unleash the Holy Spirit into the different areas of our life. And so he said this logo is brilliant because what it does is represent the unleashing of the Holy Spirit. And we're like, yeah, well, that's awesome. <laughs> you know, like, uh, I'm glad that you pointed that out. We really didn't necessarily think all the way through that, but wow, go God that we were able to uh, accomplish some, something within that. So th that's a lot about what I want to talk about is how we can unleash the Holy Spirit in our life and, and for us to know what the Holy Spirit's asking us to do, like how we would discern that. Earlier this year, when Pope Benedict announced that he was going to beatify his friend, John Paul II. I, d I didn't have to think and pray very long, and I just really felt like from the beginning that Life Teen has been a movement that really was inspired by John Paul II. His love for Mary, his love for the Eucharist. I think it's fascinating that where they've now placed his tomb at the Vatican, at St. Peter's, is directly next to the Pieta on one side and the Eucharistic Adoration Chapel on the other. So when you now go to St. Peter's and you want to pray at the tomb of Blessed John Paul II, you're directly in between the Blessed Sacrament and Mary. And that really is the two pillars of life, teen, and it's the, the, it's the whole... Uh, emphasis of the new evangelization. I was talking to Mother Assumpta this morning before she left, and she goes, you know, for as different as we are, we're so similar. And she said, because we're both so focused on Mary and the Eucharist. And she says, all these movements in the church are, you know, re-emphasizing that and how important that is. And she goes, and we don't even know where that can take us all. And I said, yeah, I know. It's, it's just such a great ride to, to know that we're connecting young people, we're connecting people uh, into a deeper relationship with Jesus, especially in the Eucharist, and then and introducing um, Mary as, as a complete intercessor. So when I went to the beatification, it was just pure joy. The first person I called was Father Bob Schreiner because, as you know from any one of the talks he gives, he can quote most of the things that John Paul II could say. And how do you do something for a priest who really just serves so selflessly? And I said, well, Father Bob, would you like to go to the beatification? And he said, yes, but it's First Communion at our parish. I don't know if I can change that. 
or I can't change it, but maybe I can get a priest. So there was one priest who could possibly do it, and the Holy Spirit worked in that priest to say, yes, he would take it because he knew how much it would mean to Father Bob to go. So Father Bob called me a few weeks later, and he said, hey, there's a priest from our diocese studying at North American College. Can he set up some masses for us around town prior to the beatification? And I thought, well, that's great. You know, I loved going to daily mass, so this would be great. And my intent on the whole trip was that we would go and we would offer up the Movement of Life team to the intercession of John Paul II. And really just ask John Paul II to intercede for us and to continue uh, whatever direction that um, he wants to have the Holy Spirit guide us, that, that, that we would be open to whatever God would be doing and that we would completely simply serve the church and offer life team to the service of the church and ask for the intercession of John Paul II. And so we had this incredible week. This priest uh, spoiled Father Bob dramatically. Uh, we got to say Mass at the baptistry where uh, Constantine was was baptized. We got to say he got to say mass at the altar where Saint Maximilian Kolbe said his first mass in Rome. We it, we got to say mass at Saint Peter's. We got to say mass. He got to say mass at on the feast day of Saint Catherine of Siena. We celebrated mass in the bedroom where she died. And then the sacristan said, "Do you want to?" Um, pray touching her casket and he opens up this little trap door behind the altar and we actually climb in and we're touching the casket and then I notice that like there's glass in front of it and there's actually people because they're there in the the church to pray it's on her feast day and they're looking at us while we're looking out at them praying on, on her it's like one of those awkward prayer moments where you're like we're lucky we're in here you know and <laughs> That probably wasn't a very prayerful thought, but at the <laughs> it's kind of what you're thinking. Like this is kind of awkward. They're praying, looking, and you know, you know how that is. Um, but you can get. It was just like I just love the Catholic Church. I always tell people I'm on the Catholic Disneyland. I think it's just great. You know, I love all the relics of saints and the and the the people that uh, die that don't decay. I love that. You know, and. Uh, I mean, we, it just, we, you know, the things we can tell teenagers about the miracles in the church. I mean, you don't need a sci-fi movie. We have it in the Catholic Church completely, you know. And I'm like, this is amazing. And maybe it's because I'm a convert that I just get so much out of it. I'm just like, that's so awesome. So Father Bob, that was actually his birthday when he got to celebrate at St. Catherine of Siena's, the bedroom where she died. They have a little altar in there. And then that night at dinner, Father Craig, his friend, leans over and pulls out of his pocket a ticket. And he says, Father Bob, on Sunday at the beatification, this is a ticket to can celebrate Mass with the Pope. You're one of 300 priests that has this honor. And I knew right then that I probably wasn't going to get anywhere near St. Peter's that day. <laughs> but, you know, I love living vicariously through other people. So I was like... Father Bob, here's your job. When you're up there, you've got to offer life teen up for the intercession of John Paul II, for, for uh, you know, for the church. And so he was able to go and just, uh, he was four rows from the Holy Father where he sat and then, you know, was able to celebrate the Mass and then distribute communion and then had some um, prayer time at the tomb of John Paul II. And it was just so fun um, to see him so excited and um, the journey that he was taking with John Paul and to have it come into that existence through that beatification and being right there. And so I wanted you to know that all the prayers that you guys have asked and for all your parishes earlier this year, about I guess that was about a month ago now, we carried them directly um, to John Paul too. And he plays a big part in this. Um, and as we discern where the Holy Spirit's taking us in our ministries, I just really encourage you to ask for the intercession of John Paul II um, through that ministry because I think it's integrally tied into what we're doing in youth ministry and his call for the new evangelization and, and young people. And he really, uh, in so many ways, is uh, the best example of a youth minister the church has ever had. So here's a question for you guys. Um, are you more or less passionate about youth ministry than the day that you started? I've been going to a lot of weddings, and one of the toasts that's happened three weddings in a row now has been, somebody says, and it's my toast and my prayer that today 
is the day that you're the least in love and that your love would only grow. So I asked you this question. In youth ministry, I don't know, maybe you're brand new to it, so you're like, oh, I'm pretty much the same as I am when I'm getting into it because I'm just starting to get into it. But for those of you that have been in a while or a couple years or been a core member for a few years or a priest working with youth, are you as passionate about it today as when you started? You notice the question is about passion. It's not about are you using the same methods? Are you still, you know, using the same program things or is every is your calendar look the same as it did the first year you started but do you have that passion do you pop out of bed every morning excited about what you get to do no it's not easy most people don't understand why you do what you do around you but is that passion still there for you because I think it's really important because young people deserve us to be passionate about what we're doing they deserve us to be fired up about it because when we show up each day they need us to be excited, passionate, and really engaged in what we're doing. So it's important, I think, as youth ministers that we always evaluate our passion. Are we still excited to do this every day? A lot of times when we take over ministry at a parish, we ask this question, was the, spirit, was the ministry spirit-led before we got here? Like, were the things that were put on the calendar with the previous youth minister or the core members that were there before us, were those things that they prayed about? Or was it just something they were trying to fill in a calendar? Was, was that really spirit-led? And I think a lot of times we spend an awful lot of time on these questions, okay? Uh, on this question. And we wonder about that and we think about the past. But I really think uh, what we're, we're missing the point when we ask this question. So I don't think as youth leaders we need to dwell on it too long. What we really need to ask is this. Are we spirit-led now? Have we prayed about everything that we're doing and are we feeling led by the spirit to do it? Or are we simply doing a bunch of good things and hoping that God blesses them? And that if we, if we do our best attempt at thinking we're doing something good, will God bless it? Or do we know for sure that we're doing what God's asking us to do. As a leader of Life Teen, this is a question we've been asking, all the leaders of Life Teen have been asking this, is our, it's real easy to get your ministry to go really wide. You can all, people come up to us with ideas all the time. Why don't you start this type of ministry? You guys are good at this type of ministry. You'd be great at starting this type of ministry. And we, we take that to prayer, obviously. But it's not necessarily our goal to become this really wide-ranging ministry. It's more our goal right now, what we feel God calling us to do is to go deeper, is to have more depth, because that's where young people are. They're seeking more depth, and, and God's calling us as, as a movement of Life Teen to go deeper. And that's why, hopefully, you get that from the conference, that this week maybe there's a sense that we're trying to go deeper and that we're encouraging you to do that well as well with your teens, because they really are seeking that. And so... The question is, are, is it spirit-led now, our ministry? So how can we know for sure that we're doing God's plan and not merely our own? I love this picture. They were putting up this big banner of John Paul II at St. Peter's um, and just, just seeing the resolve in his eyes and the, the love that, that John Paul has, has for young people and remembering that on his... Um, deathbed, one of the last things he said was to young people, he said, I went looking for you, and now in, in, in the end, you've come for me. Because the, the square at St. Peter's was filled with, with, with young people. And, and I think for us, as we go out looking for young people and evangelizing, John Paul II wasn't afraid to go out and interact with young people. And, and I believe he's calling us all to do that. So the reality is our ministries won't be spirit-led unless we ourselves are spirit-led. If we're open to the promptings of the Spirit in our life and, 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 and we allow ourselves to say yes to whatever God's asking us to do, it can take us in great places. Sometimes we don't always understand why He's leading us in the direction He's leading us. But our yes to God um, ensures that our ministry stays spirit-led. So what does the church need? 
The reality is it needs less and less of our ideas and more and more guidance from the Holy Spirit. And, you know, we love priests within Life Teen, and we look for the guidance of our bishops and our priests and our pastors to help us discern what we're supposed to do in youth ministry and to partner with us and work together with that. I had a, a, a time with Bishop Olmstead after Mass yesterday. We filmed a little segment and on there. I just said, Bishop Olmstead, we just pledge our obedience to you and all the bishops. We just simply want to serve the church. And it's our prayer that as lay people that we could be inspired by the Holy Spirit and, and help lift up the church and help bring life to the church and help young people to come to know their faith in a vibrant way where they are, are not just the future of the church, but they are the church now. And their talents um, can be shared with a church that so much needs um, those talents and and. Um, it's just, I don't know in your perspective, but from my perspective, these are some of the most bright and talented young people we've ever had the honor to minister side by side with. They, they are incredibly resilient. Um, you know, and the, in the day when we would do life nights, we'd have this like flow of the life night where we'd have to, you know, ramp up for a... Uh, you know, make it the, like a skit and it'd be powerful then into this talk and you couldn't do something funny right before the talk because they couldn't shift gears like that. Now it's only us as adults that can't shift gears like that. The teens can go from something incredibly funny to something incredibly deep spiritually. You know, back and forth, they are able to shift gears so quickly and it's, it's great. They're, they're able to take in so much information and, and they really do want to be challenged in their faith. So it's, it's a really exciting time to work with them. And, and so uh, I think that the church really needs us to continue to be simply guided by the Holy Spirit so that what we're doing is sold out just for what the Holy Spirit's asking us to do and not our own version of it. And that's our prayer for Life Teen. And I, I love this prayer. Come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, enkindle with us the fire of your love, send forth your spirit, and we shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. Two key things in this prayer. One, that we shall be created by the Holy Spirit. Are we allowing the Holy Spirit to create us? Are we allowing the Holy Spirit, are we giving this Holy Spirit permission to work in our life enough where we could be created? Or are we just taking bits and pieces of the Holy Spirit that fit with our mindset or our thoughts and the parts that seem a little bit too difficult or don't make sense right now, do we kind of like put them to the side and, and just take the parts that, of what God may be giving us through our conversation with the Holy Spirit, um, what makes us comfortable? Or are we saying, no, create me. Allow it all to come. What, form me in whatever way you want to form me, Lord. And then the second part is this, and this is always good in ministry for this perspective, is that, and you shall renew the face of the earth. That it's God who's re- renewing the face of the earth. As we are created, as we become everything that God wants us to become through this movement of the Holy Spirit in our lives and this outpouring of the Holy Spirit into everything that we do, it's God that's creating that. We can never in ministry ever confuse something that's coming from God versus something that's coming from us. And nor can we fall into the trap of feeling that it's us that's doing it. The reality is, when we bring teens to Jesus, it's God that's ultimately drawn them there. Yes, we are the hands and feet at times for Christ, but it's God that's really doing the work within that. And when we have that perspective that we're on God's mission, not our own mission, it puts it into a good perspective for us. So I want to give you a couple tips um, on how we would discern uh, how the Holy Spirit moves in our life. Just some things from, from the road that I'm on, on journeying in faith, that I thought I would share because I heard Mother Assumpta talking yesterday about us being more contemplative and then what would we do with what maybe we hear God giving us. So, yeah, it's the Holy Spirit. So how do we discern what the Holy Spirit wants? I think a lot of us are afraid to even discern what the Holy Spirit wants because the sense is that if we really listen to God, he was going to ask us to jump off this cliff. 
He was going to, like, we're going to pray, but he's going to give me something so radical I don't want to hear it, and I know what he's going to ask me to do. He's going to ask me to move, or he's going to ask me to sell everything I have, or he's going to ask me to do this complete turnaround, and I'm going to have to jump off this cliff. And in my experience, I know people that have had been, who have been asked to take a leap of faith. But when talking to them, it's rarely by surprise. They can think over the last several years about promptings that God's been giving them. People he's put in their life, little steps that they've taken of trust with God. And I rarely find anybody that just starts praying and, you know, just like, just out of the blue, God says, just jump off now, I'll show you, you're going to trust me. Basically what happens is there's already been a rhythm of prayer going and that you're already getting promptings from the Spirit, and that it's been maybe smaller steps, smaller steps, and then you're finally going to get to a spot where God's going to ask you to make a bigger one. But it's not that you don't have any momentum going. So when you go jump off the cliff, it's, you already have momentum going, and God's already built up like on a ramp, and you're moving that way, and then you're able to make the jump. No, that's pretty much how God works with us. He shows us examples. The only problem is this. A lot of times we mistake God's blessings for things that we think we somehow manufactured. And in reality is, we have to think of it all as God. How God put pieces in our life and and gave us glimpses of how he provides for us. For those of you that work in full-time youth ministry, monetary trust is a really difficult thing. Because oftentimes we're in a situation where maybe our salary doesn't cover our expenses, especially when you start having a family. How, do you, how does that work? But if you think back over the years as you've grown in that, God has always provided. That there, God has always taken, taken care. So when he asks you to take a bigger stride, a bigger step, you have a history with God of him providing for you. As an example in that. So oftentimes we think we have this, this, this cliff model, but reality is God is leading us to these decisions and are moving us in a certain direction. We already have momentum going that way. And when you, when you think about that history that you have with God moving you in those directions, it makes sense. And you go, okay, Lord, I'm going to trust you again in this. And that seems to me how the, the Spirit moves in, in ways in my life. Now here's the trap Oftentimes, when things are going really, really well, we stop praying, or we pray less, because we think we have it down. But I believe in youth ministry, it's so critical that we pray more when things are going really well. I heard a story earlier this year about a priest who was studying to be the priest who performed exorcisms in his diocese, and they sent him to Rome. And he worked for a week with the head of the church who works with, uh, within exorcisms. And they went out to a couple of people's houses, and actually he, he helped perform an exorcism with this priest. And during the exorcism, uh, this priest would call out saints' names. And in particular, he would call out John Paul too. And when in both cases, when John Paul II's name was uttered, the person had an incredibly violent reaction to that name. And so later this priest asked the priest from Rome why there was such um, a, a violent reaction. And he said, because he worked with youth and because he reached so many youth. And I think we have to realize that, like Mother Assumpta said, we're working with youth and we're working for the souls of teens. When things are going well, we need to even pray more. We need to really guard ourselves with prayer because we are having an impact. And if you are in ministry and you don't feel resistance, you may not be going the direction God wants you to go. I, I become very comfortable knowing that before we're going to do a retreat or an event, something's going to happen. There's going to be something that, that just like kind of takes the, the air out of the balloon or something good's getting ready to happen. I, I'm always excited now when something bad happens prior to something good that we're about to do because I know we're getting ready to lead young people closer to Christ. Do you feel that way? And do you relate to that? But when things are going well, we've got to make sure that we keep praying because it's a trap that we wouldn't pray those times. So oftentimes we'll pray harder when great things are happening. 
Like we could say, this has been a great convention. We need to pray harder. Not say, oh, that was great, and we'll just keep moving on. We need to pray harder. So here's the steps to discern the movement of the Holy Spirit. First, place yourself in a spot where God can speak to you. Twofold. For me, it's in front of the Blessed Sacrament. I really trust my prayer in front of the Blessed Sacrament more than other places. For some people, it's a room in their house. It's, it's, a, it's a time of maybe reading scripture prior to it. But put yourself in a spot. And the key thing to this is to empty your heart of any of your own desires. Is just try to be as empty as possible. I love the song that Audrey sang right before the session started. It just talked about like emptying ourselves. Because so, I think that's really how God can... Can, can work through us when, when we've kind of let go of ourself and our own desires and just simply listen to God, what he wants to, wants to give us. Oftentimes I journal, and I've said this at other conferences, but I always have people come up and tell me that they take it back and it, and it helps them. Uh, for me, I'm very simplistic and childlike in my faith. So I have a journal, and, uh, and, and I basically I write a J for Jesus and an R for Randy. And so I will write the R first, and then I will ask Jesus a question. And I'll empty my heart. I'll be before the Blessed Sacrament. And then after the J, I just start writing whatever God gives me as far as, you know, uh, an answer. And the first couple lines often sound like it's just me. But as I get going, it's supposed to be gut-wrenching and, you know, as transparent as I can about whatever I'm asking the question about I, it just isn't very long before I know that it's not me speaking anymore. And that God, God just speaks to me. And, you know, speaks through that journaling. So I really encourage if, if you have, um, want to hear the voice of God at times, ask what he's asking you to do, is to take that to journal. Um, or to a, a time of prayer where he can just openly, openly speak to you. The second one is don't do this alone. Get at least one other person that you can discern it with. I really strongly recommend you having a spiritual director. Somebody that you can, that knows you, that's on a spiritual journey with you, that can tell you that you're not going crazy or can tell you that you're off track and that you need to get back on track. I get both things from my spiritual director. Um, but it's very helpful to have people that to discern that. If you're a minister and you're discerning something for Life Teen at your parish or Edge at your parish or what your, uh, direction you're supposed to go, um, I encourage you to include more people to discern this with. I'm always bringing ideas up to our staff about things that I may be getting in prayer and asking them to help and step in and, and to be part of that. So get someone to discern it with you so that it's not something that is just your hearing. And oftentimes people will come to me with an affirmation or a, new, a nuance to what God may have given that's even better that I didn't get the full clear picture on it, but then he moves you to that direction. And then the, the third step is let it sit. We don't have to immediately make an, uh, a, a decision on it most of the time. So what you want to do is, if that's what you feel you're called to do, sit on it for a while. Commit to it. Live it for a day, an hour. Or a week, that that's what the decision is going to be. That God's calling you to that. What does that feel like? And what I always use as a barometer for this is peace. It may not make sense to you. It might be something that is going to rock a bunch of people's worlds. But deep down, do you still have peace about it? Like you definitely feel God's calling you to do it. And if you have that peace, then you know, I, I really believe God gives you peace for those things that you're supposed to do. It will, it will pass all understanding if it's something that the Spirit's asking you to do. And then the final phase is to determine the timing and take action. Just because God gives you something in prayer, he might just be preparing you for the leap off of the cliff, but it's not time to leap off of the cliff yet. God will make it really clear what timing is. Sometimes we can get ahead of God. God will, keep, will give us things and then we'll move forward and we can mess it up. So oftentimes we have to make sure, the last step is to make sure it's the timing is in line with what God's asking us to do. Does that make sense? 
Last year at this training convention, we had a board meeting prior to the prior to it, and one of the things that we had gotten in prayer, both Aaron Kleckner, myself, and several people, that we were supposed to start a store in Atlanta, and it was going to be like a a Catholic resource center, and we were supposed to move our offices there, and that, and I presented it to our board of directors, and we really felt, I felt confident in prayer that it was time, you know, that we needed to do it. The board of directors just looked at me and said, no, it's not time, Um, and basically said no, and I remember walking out of that room and walking up to Aaron and saying, Aaron, I know that your truck is packed and you're ready to move to Atlanta to start this. And I thought for sure our board of directors was going to say yes. But they said no, not now. And Erin felt so convicted in prayer that she came to me a couple hours later and said, I'm still moving. I think we're supposed to do it. Maybe the timing's different. Well, it's a year later now. And next Monday, we start construction on renovating the space that now we're going to have for this center. God made it clear throughout this year that it was his timing, not ours. And that we needed to present that to our board to kind of lay the groundwork for it. But in the God's time, not ours. And I just know, um, I'm just so excited for it because I know God's been leading us every step of the way. And it hasn't been easy, no. But there's been a peace that's been riding underneath it all for all of us that have been discerning it. And we kind of know that God's asking us to do it. And we don't even know what's going to happen with it, um, all the, the width of what, how the ministry is going to happen there. We just know that God's calling us to do it. And we're trying to stay right on his timing, not ours. So the last question before I close is this. I talk to a lot of youth leaders and I ask them, who they have praying for them. And it's always one of those questions that falls with a bunch of silence. And if that priest who shared the story about asking for the intercession of John Paul II when they're in a spiritual battle with someone and there's a violent reaction and you are on the direct, you're you're directly working with young people to reaching souls for, for, for their souls... Do you have someone that's interceding for you? Someone that's a prayer warrior for you? Do you have someone that daily lifts you up for your ministry? And if you don't, I encourage you to ask someone. The power of intercessory prayer is one of the most powerful things that that we can do for each other. And, And so don't be afraid to ask someone to, to lift you up and to pray for you. I often tell parishes when they're getting ready to start that youth ministers should go to the, lady, the ladies' rosary group that meets every morning and prays the rosary. They have like a direct line to God, you know? Or if you know people that are really deep in their faith or have a love for youth, and tell them what you're trying to do and tell them that you need their prayers, that you need their intercessory prayers. You can be assured that the staff of Life Teen prays for you every day. But get people around you that are praying for you, that are lifting you up. I promise you it'll make a tremendous difference in your ministry. You, you won't, you, it may not be something that you um, know how to quantify or put a, a value on. But over time you'll realize, you'll know that those prayers have been there. And there will be moments when you go, that was so awesome that they were praying for for me specifically during that so get someone that's there advocating for you that's praying for you and offering you up in intercession